Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Hayoti. I'm the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations at Teachers College, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for the Alumni Career Develop Webinar Series featuring Dean Fusto. The webinar series covers a range of career topics and includes speakers from a variety of backgrounds. The series is co-sponsored by the TC Office of Career Education and Professional Development and the Office of Alumni Relations. Videos of past webinars are available on our website at www.tc.edu slash alumni slash career webinars. Today, alumnus Dean Fusto will present Navigating the Independent School Career Landscape. Dean Fusto is the president of Brandon Hall School, a global boarding and day school serving students in grades six to 12. His career spans two decades as a teacher and educational leader in kindergarten to college independent boarding and international school education. He founded the teachlearnlead.org global education library in 2013 as a tribute to his heroes and heroines teachers. Over time, the education library has grown in scope to an audience of over 30,000 across four social media platforms and is positioned as a destination for teachers and school leaders around the globe who are seeking professional development and access to the latest educational research. Dean is a past recipient of a National Endowment of the Humanities Fellowship and an EE Ford Fellowship from the National Association of Independent Schools. He has published several books and holds an MAT from the SIT Graduate Institute and a master's from Teachers College, Columbia University, and a certificate in proactive leadership training from Cornell University. He has founded and designed numerous exper experiential service learning trips for hundreds of students and teachers. In 2017, he established the Center for Global Youth Leadership and Social Entrepreneurial St Studies at Brandon Hall School. And I'll now give the word to Dean Fusto. Well, welcome everyone. And thank you for both being here and, and showing an interest in navigating the independent school landscape. My, my goal tonight really is to take a deep dive, but I realize that, that many of you or, or each of you come to this webinar for different reasons, for different purposes. Uh, some of you may know a little bit about independent schools and some of you may know absolutely nothing about independent schools. And, and wherever you are along that continuum, please know that's fine. Um, my presentation is, is really meant to, to help you walk away knowing a lot more than, than, than when you started. Uh, so we will explore a, a number of things, but I, I want to really begin with defining our terms, because I think there's a lot of confusion around what independent schools are, what, what that term even means. And it's understandable because I believe less than 10% of, of all schools in the United States, and, and I'm, talking primarily of K through 12 models are independent schools. So let's begin first by breaking down each part of this definition. And I will read through the definition, but then I wanna take it apart for you. So independent schools are nonprofit private schools that are independent in philosophy, each driven by its own unique mission. They're also independent in the way they're managed and financed. Each is governed by an independent board of trustees and financed primarily by tuition and charitable contributions. And typically they're accredited by state approved accrediting bodies. So let's look at that first sentence there. Uh, independent schools primarily are nonprofit models. And by independent in philosophy, Every, every independent school that I've ever worked in, and most of them are defined by their own mission. And that mission could have started with the founders of the school. Um, it could have been tweaked or, or, or changed over time. But for the most part, when a school um, commits to building that brick and mortar around, they're, they're building it around a foundation that is mission-based. And I don't mean mission in 
in religious or spiritual terms, although it could be a, a parochial type school or a, a religious based school. But a mission can can really be and often is secular, non sectarian. Uh, also, when we talk about independent schools, it's very key to understand that that independence does refer to the way that each school is managed and financed. So basically independent schools are tuition based uh, in order to create their operating budgets in order to survive and thrive. Tuition is a very high percentage of what allows that to, to happen and be sustained. In addition to tuition, Oftentimes you'll see in independent schools, a director of development or an advancement office where fundraising is a key piece every year. Uh, similar to what Teachers College does, there's an annual fund or other types of events that help to raise funds to also support the school. So that helps us hopefully with just a, a basic definition of independent schools. And you'll see down on the bottom of the page where I reference NAIS.org that is the National Association of Independent Schools. It's an amazing uh, resource for anyone who wants to learn more about the independent school world. You will see me reference that website often through this presentation, including on, the, on this page. So let's look at two of what I would say are the most prevalent, prominent independent school organizations. If you are going to become an independent school, expert or just become more savvy about independent schools, you're going to want to bookmark both of these sites. And I, I will walk you through um, each one and how they're a little bit different. So NAIS, again, is the National Association of Independent Schools. It is located in Washington, DC, and it's kind of the umbrella organization. It's not an accrediting agency, but it's the umbrella organization to about 1,800 member schools. 1,500 of which are in the United States. TABS is located in Asheville, North Carolina, and that specifically uh, targets about 300 independent schools that are boarding schools. And again, TABS is a membership organization. So within that independent school world, we also have boarding schools as a subset of them. And we're gonna talk in much more detail about that as well. But again, I recommend, uh, strongly recommend that you bookmark both of these uh, websites. Now, this is always a very interesting piece for me because I like to really have people think about independent schools as having multiple types of designs and structures. So by virtue of that word independent, and again, let's go back to thinking about how each school has their own mission. Let's look at some of these categories that comprise independent schools. So first, you could have independent schools that are kindergarten through sixth grade, kindergarten through eighth grade. There are even some that are kindergarten through ninth. And these are oftentimes uh, belong to that subset of independent schools that are called junior boarding schools, where um, students may start boarding, boarding as early as fourth or fifth grade through, through ninth grade. Then you have K through 12 or kindergarten through 12th, kindergarten through PG. PG stands for postgraduate. So that means uh, beyond 12th grade, sometimes you may get a student who wants to do an extra year, who feels like, their 12th grade experience, while it may have been fruitful, maybe just wasn't enough and they want to go to a school for a postgraduate year, a year after 12th grade, that's still a high school, but to really give them even more of a, a foundation to make them a more attractive candidate to a college, to give them more leadership skills or more uh, academic, um, more academic strength. Then you have schools that may be 6 through 12 and 9 through 12. So there's a whole range of, of grades for these schools. The next category is a day school. And as we go through this list and throughout this presentation, really start to absorb and take in and immerse yourself in the language of independent schools. So a day school really means what it says. It's a school that primarily is a 
eight o'clock to four o'clock type school. And the reason that's important is it's contrasted with the next category, which is a boarding school. In a boarding school, like the one I work, many of the students, maybe not all, but a percentage of them, live and reside in a dormitory setting. So you'll have boarding schools that may have one large co-ed dorm, or you may have boarding schools that have 10, 15 dorms. It just, it just is based on the size of the school. Next, you have a hybrid model. A hybrid is exactly what the word suggests. It's a school that is a combination of both boarding, a boarding component and a day component. So you may have 50% of the kids who come from all over the United States who board or internationally that board, but the other 50% may come from the local community. So a hybrid school. The next category is gender-based. Many independent schools are all male or all boys schools. Many are all girls schools. The vast majority are co-ed. Next, you have independent schools that do have a religious affiliation. So there could be Catholic independent schools, Episcopalian independent schools, uh, non-denominational, uh, Quaker schools. And then you have the non-sectarian schools that have no religious affiliation or were not founded on any kind of religious mission. Next category, you have military schools that fall into the independent school, uh, fall under the independent school umbrella. Sports academies, this is where students typically will do both an academic program, but they're also going to the school because they have an affinity or a talent or a real skill set in a particular sport. You'll see these oftentimes, I think in, in Colorado, New England, in, in places where skiing is a, a major industry or activity, you'll see ski academies. Uh, Florida, I know, has several tennis or golf sports academies. So very interesting. And then finally, another category of an independent school would be an IB or an international baccalaureate school. So those are our categories. And I know as we go through all of this, um, I'm sure questions will arise. So please feel free to type any questions and they will come to me via chat. And although this webinar is not one where we're able to interact verbally, I, I will at the end give you my contact information and invite you anytime to follow up with questions. Let's continue. So let's look at some defining characteristics. We've, we've talked about categories now of independent schools. We've done a definition for what they are. But these would be some of, if, if we're going to generalize about schools with the independent moniker, these are some characteristics that they all have, or most have. have. So first we talked about in the United States, fewer than 10% of all school age students attend independent schools. We talked about a characteristic earlier as being mission-based and for the most part, tuition dependent. Independent schools typically, especially ones that have, have some longevity, have what's called endowments. And these are kind of, uh, I guess you can think of them as uh, uh, savings accounts that the, the school has, has that often will match or double their operating budget. So it gives the school a little bit more security, uh, sustainability, but you'll often hear that, that term used in endowment. Some of the titles that we give to different roles in an independent school are very characteristic of them. For example, it's rare to see principal, although you will see it occasionally. More often you're going to see head of school or headmaster or president. And a little bit later in our webinar, I'll, I'll add a few more of these types of titles that you will see or hear often in, in the independent school lexicon. Typically, a very important defining characteristic and one that independent schools, I think, wear as a badge of pride to differentiate themselves from many other schools is 
the small class size. So that ratio there that you see uh, is the national average for independent schools, about 8.6 to 1. And many schools uh, will, will actually make it part of their, their mission that they, they, they don't want to be, be, ever be bigger than 15 to 1 or, or 16 to 1. So you typically have a, a high degree of connection between teacher and student. You oftentimes in independent schools, um, especially the smaller ones, uh, it's likely that every teacher knows every student or every coach knows every student in the school. Admissions is another defining characteristic. So uh, every independent school has an admissions office, much like a college has an admissions office where students have to apply, uh, families help them fill out forms, there are recommendations involved, and there's often an admissions team or committee that will make the final call on whether a student is able to matriculate, whether a student is accepted into the school. Advancement or development are, are important characteristics because if you recall, I mentioned that tuition only can cover so much of a school's operating budget. So oftentimes the development or advancement team are the, the ones who are responsible for fundraising and different kinds of events that would bring other revenue into the school. And then the role of alumni another very important part of independent schools as the alumni base again much like in a college uh, very important to a school now here's another i think uh, pretty specific defining characteristic and that's that these schools are tuition based uh, and compared to public education or, or charter schools that are are basically tax funded and, and free education uh, independent schools aren't. And although they give, often are able to give financial aid to many of the, the students who are, are needing aid, you see there that the average day tuition in independent school is around 22,000 and in a boarding environment, about 51,000. The $12,000 uh, piece there refers to an average amount of aid given to students who qualify for aid. In independent schools, by virtue of the title independent, often teachers who work there, administrators who work there are coming to a school like that because they believe there'll be a high degree of teacher autonomy in the classroom in terms of being able to, to do a lot of the other things that they're passionate about in the school. For example, Oftentimes, in a, a, let me speak for a boarding school and myself, when I first started working in a boarding school, not only did I teach, but I was also able to work with students as a dorm parent and as a coach. So I, I, knowing students in many different ways amplifies the perspective of someone who works in an independent school. And then finally, uh, I would say another shared characteristic is a, a very high expectation that the students who graduate from independent schools are going to go on to four-year colleges. Uh, many schools will tout 100% of their graduates go on to colleges. There isn't necessarily an expectation of what colleges they will attend. I think match is, becomes very important for, for schools and families, but many independent schools, if not most, will have a director of college placement or a college uh, placement team that helps students every step of the way and, and works with their families to figure out what that next step will be and where they will hopefully attend or at least apply and then ultimately attend college. So those are some of the defining characteristics. Now, because the second half of this webinar is really about giving you concrete tips on how to navigate and enter the independent school world and hopefully once there be able to thrive there. The next few slides will be under this topic of career tips. I wanna give you some ideas 
on how you can begin your journey into independent school education, whether it's coming in as a teacher, an administrator, or in some other role. So the first thing you wanna do is to be mission aware. And by mission aware, I mean, if you're going to begin a true search process to find a career or a position in independent school, you really need to start with the mission of that school. And typically you'll go to a, their, their website and the mission is front and center. There'll always be a tab or somewhere where you can, you can find that very quickly. So you want to be aware of that mission, but then I would say go a step further and be, be certain that your own ideals and philosophies about education are in true alignment with that school's mission. Because if you have that, you're already a leg up on most other candidates who apply for a position in independent school. Let me, let me give you a specific example of what I mean. So there'll be many people that'll go to a job board and they'll just see an opening for, let's say they're going to one of these independent school job boards that I'll be telling you about. They see an opening for an English teacher. And just kind of impetuously, they, they'll, they'll send their cover letter and a resume. Without even really looking at the school, without taking a deep dive into their website, and without looking at their mission. I think that's a real flaw and truly puts that person at a disadvantage. Whereas if you take your time on the front end, look at all the positions that are opening in your field in an independent school, and then go into those websites, pick 10, look and analyze what their mission is. And then I would say, don't apply to the schools that you know you, you, there is no kind of resonance with. So that first key, be mission aware, to me is one of the most important. Because certainly if you get to the interview phase, you will be asked, why, why our school? Do you believe in our mission? Do you know what our mission is? Very important. Next, be clear. So by this, I mean, as we go through this webinar and I've explained characteristics and I've defined an independent school for you, and I share anecdotes from my own experience, you need to be very clear why an independent school? Why not a charter school? Why not be involved in the homeschool movement? Why not a public school? And then even more so, drill it down even further, the age group. What age group are you looking for? And are, are you someone who likes working with elementary age students? Are you someone who really wants to work with high school age? Are you someone who wants to work in a boarding environment where you're actually living on campus and in a 24 seven type world where you, you're, you're, again, as I told you earlier, you might be coaching and advising and being a dorm parent. Um, so you have to be clear. And then finally, be culturally cognizant. And by this, again, it's your own knowledge of what an independent school is, how it's different from other schools, how it differentiates itself, and being, being very understanding that families who send their kids to an independent school often are paying these pretty high tuitions. So they're, they're making sacrifices to send their kids to these schools. And, and it's important that you're culturally sensitive to that and aware of it. Now, career tip number two, how do you launch your career in an independent school? So you're doing this webinar now, you're hopefully getting a great deal of content and information that's helpful to you. But what's next? How can you start to explore and investigate the possibility of working in an independent school? The first piece here for you to think about is that oftentimes there are what's called search firms. 
Now you probably have heard of search firms in the corporate world, but they very much exist in the independent school world as well. And in a future slide, I'm actually going to go through different types of search firms. But be aware of these, and as we talk more about them, begin to, to explore their strengths and what they offer and, and which ones maybe charge you a fee and which ones don't. And again, we'll go into a little more detail about that shortly. There are a host of independent school job boards. So I can't really give you a number because there's probably more than I can count. But I can tell you that I, I have a resource for you that I will share in a moment where with one click, you can be you can have access to probably about 15 or 20 of these job boards. I've done the work for you. But beyond that 15 and 20, there are many, many, many more. And as we move on, I will tell you about those as well. Now, the resource that I was telling you about is teachlearnlead.org, which is a site I founded a few years back. And it was part of the introduction that, that Sarah gave. On that site, if you bookmark it or, or, or start to visit it more often, first of all, the Teach Learn Lead is, a, is an education or an edu library. And I constantly update it uh, with curated content. I have multiple categories uh, on the, the website. And if you're someone who really likes to stay on the cutting edge around educational research and pedagogy and leadership, all of it's there for you. But more importantly and more relevant to this presentation today is there's a career tab. And if you go to that career tab, front and center, you will see that I've laid out probably 10 to 15 independent school search firms for you. And all you have to do is click. So I hope you will avail yourself of teachlearnlead.org and all that it has to offer you. Now, in terms of being a savvy searcher, someone who's, who is knowledgeable or comes across as being knowledgeable to a prospective employee, you wanna make sure again that when and if you get to the point that you are doing an interview or even in your cover letter, you need to show a certain amount of expertise in the school you're applying to. The, the folks or the committees that will look at CVs will most likely discard those because they, they, there's many applicants. They will discard those that don't reflect someone who, an applicant who's really taken the time to look at the school, learn their mission, and, and reference parts of the school in the cover letter. So again, I can't accentuate that enough. And I don't apologize for repeating myself because I've seen people make this mistake so many times as I review over my 20 years, countless resumes, countless cover letters. And the ones that don't really show any knowledge of the school are ones that tend not to make it into that next level or next round. Part of showing your expertise in the, of the independent school world is understanding the language and the lexicon of independent schools. So earlier we talked about terms like advancement, development, admissions, enrollment, headmaster, head of school. Here are some others. Dorm parents. So in a boarding program, and remember, there's about 300 boarding schools. You may be applying to some of these. You, you're going to want to know what a dorm parent means. And that, that almost always in a boarding school is someone who lives and works either in a dorm with students or in an annex to a dorm. And why that's appealing for, for many people, boarding schools, apart from just wanting to have those kinds of deep connections with kids and live in a, in a community like a boarding school is, there's a real financial benefit there because as a dorm parent, oftentimes your housing and your utilities and your food, all of those things are taken care of by the school, which for some makes it very attractive. 
another part of the lexicon, a trustee, a board member. Those are key, key components, key leadership pieces to an independent school. And you want to, you just want to know what those those terms mean, and what and what trustees and what board members may may do in a school. Other types of positions you find in independent schools: an academic dean, a dean of faculty, a dean of students, a director of diversity. Sometimes you'll get a director of international education, an enrollment management officer, an admissions associate, an assistant head. So all of these terms, when you begin to visit some of the job boards that I've told you about, you'll see those terms and those labels delineated often. And it's good that you know what they mean. It's important that you know what they mean. And then the final, this is by no means a full dictionary of language and lexicon. These are just some of the highlights because I could do an entire webinar just on that alone. Uh, but a few others would be financial aid, the concept of retention, attrition, and strategic plans. Now, I promised you earlier that we would revisit and return to the idea of a search firm. So you can definitely, as an individual, go to job boards, do your homework, find schools that you really feel like you're aligned well with, and, and, and do the whole search on your own. No question about it. You can do that. I've done that in my career, and I've, I've, I've had success finding really great positions. But there are... You would be remiss if you didn't take a very close look at search firms and what they offer to you as a candidate in your exploration of an independent school position. Now, oftentimes, the good news is a search firm doesn't charge you as a candidate any fee. It's the school that often is the one that is paying the fee to employ the search firm to find great candidates. So basically what, what they're doing, a search firm, is vetting and, and delivering a pool of highly qualified people, applicants to the school. So let's look at some types of search firms that you wanna be aware of. First category, national or international, these tend to be large search firms with many, many uh, recruitment officers that have connections really in almost every state where you'd find an independent school, including internationally. Carney Sando is one of the largest that I know of in the independent school world. Then you have global search firms. So if you're someone who says, I, I want to work in an independent school, but I, I really, really want to work overseas. Firms and sites such as TIE, which stands for the International Educator, or Search Associates, they do nothing but global. Their focus is global. So if that's something you care about or something you want to pursue, then those would be the types of search firms you would look for. Then you have regional search firms. And this would be an organization like Southern Teachers, FCIS, which stands for the Florida Council of Independent Schools, Triple AIS, which is right here in Atlanta where I'm based. But those are only a few. Almost all regions of the United States will have um, these types of organizations. Now, in some cases, Southern Teachers, for example, they cover, I think, about 12 to 15 states. They're, they're truly a search firm. Um, but FCIS and AAAIS are more on the job board side of the equation. They're, they're, not, they're not search firms per se, but they're organizations you can go to and find specific positions in specific areas or states. 
And then finally, um, there are what I refer to as boutique search firms. And these are organizations that are often more tailored towards uh, senior administrative roles or head of school or executive type positions. And they, they tend to do fewer searches a year and are much more highly specialized. Now, in, in the whole search firm process, oftentimes what you would be asked to do is to create a, an online application and then once you've done that, and oftentimes there'll be an interview as part of that, if you're accepted as a candidate with that search firm, you'll begin to get referrals. So you should continue the search on your own, but also the search firm is going to work for you. And, and you will get emails or updates saying, this school has an opening. You're probably a good match. Would you like to apply? So again, there's a a little bit of a, a deep dive into search firms and how they work. The next career tip has to do with timelines. So in an independent school, and again, I'm generalizing, but for most of my two decade career, these kind of timelines have held true. And I think they're good to be aware of. If you're someone looking for a very high level position like a head of school, a president, uh, maybe even an assistant head or a, a director type role. Oftentimes these will go public a year in advance or a year early. So you really want to get a, a, a leg up. And that's why the, the whole process of looking for a career in an independent school is an ongoing exploration. Uh, I know in the, in the times in my career when I've been engaged in a search or when I'm giving people advice on doing a search, my, my, my biggest point I make to them is always bookmark a number of your favorite independent schools that you found and every couple of weeks go to their employment board because the schools often will have an employment tab and see if something's opened up. Or go to these job boards that I've told you about and just be checking in on a regular basis. Now, usually for a senior administrator, it's about a half a year in advance, sometimes a little bit less than that. But you wanna be, again, you wanna be looking. And then for teachers, for the most part, uh, in independent schools, you're on an annual contract. So March tends to be contract season. And because of that, it's also the time of year when schools begin to post openings for teaching positions. So the timelines become a big factor as you go deeper into your career search and try to navigate the world of independent schools. Now, I'm open to taking as many questions as, we're, as time will allow, but I do want to also remind you that I will give you my contact information. And if you email me, I, I will try my best to respond to you, give you some resources. But remember to visit www.teachlearnlead.org because so many of the, the so much of the information I've shared with you tonight uh, is on there, including those job boards and those search firms, and even uh, I have a, a page in my collection on school designs. There's probably about 40 types of um, ways that schools de design themselves around a mission or with a mission as a foundation. So one of the questions uh, that I had a little bit earlier came from Elizabeth, who's participating in the webinar with us. And she asked how or what is the best way to learn about different compensation benefits in independent schools? This can be a little complicated, uh, only because there are definitely regional differences in salary and compensation packages. Oftentimes, too, 
school size can matter. So it's not necessarily a truism, but I have seen it to play out that if a school is very small, sometimes they're not able to provide an applicant with the same amount of compensation or a package as a larger school. But Elizabeth, I would tell you that NAIS is still a great place to, to go because that is a, a site that, that is dedicated completely to independent schools and to, to making people more knowledgeable about those schools. And I believe it's been a while since I've had to, to look at this, but I believe they actually post information about average or median salaries by region or by state, by type of school. And I don't know whether that information, you have to be a member of an AIS to access it, but oftentimes that is where you can find that information or you can go to some of those regional um, sites that I talked about earlier, the Florida Council of Independent Schools, or look at your own state and see if there's an independent school um, accreditation organization there uh, because they too would have some of that information. So it's hard to give you any kind of specific numbers. I just can't do that because there's so much variance and variety. Another question I had, which I, I think I've already uh, answered a few times is, uh, can I be contacted for any help and guidance? And of course, it, as time allows, I, I'm willing to help you uh, if you want to email me uh with either by either giving you more resources or shooting you a quick reply um, if, if it's something that I could answer relatively quickly. So I'm going to just click on here uh, the, the live chat to see if any other questions have come up. Uh, Dean? Yes, I do want to say that we have um, two more questions. Uh, okay. I am putting them in the, I can actually read them loud. I've been trying to assign them to you. Um, one of the questions are, how many years of teaching experience independent schools require to go for a management position? You know, it's one of those, um, that's always a tough question too, because people come sometimes from other industries into independent schools. So I don't think there's a necessarily a pat answer to that. All these schools are so different, but I think if you if you show that you've taught in, in an independent school and maybe you've taken on some leadership roles there, um, you have a, a you know you have a pretty good opportunity to grow and and take on some of these managerial positions that you're referring to. Often though, I'll tell you, the best way that this happens is when you've been in a school for a few years, you, you often do get opportunities to wear so many other hats. And that's what leads to um, adding new dimensions or layers to your work and being able to have some of those opportunities. Now, another question I see here, what suggestions do you have regarding following up with an application through NAIS? A lot of it depends on timeline, if a timeline is specified in a job description. Um, so as you're reading through a job description and you, you see something you really like and you, you follow to a T what they've asked you to submit in terms of paperwork and part of an application package, sometimes they will post a timeline. And if they don't, I think it's, I think it's okay. Uh, and I'm speaking as, as someone who does a, a significant amount of hiring. I think it shows interest that you check in maybe at the, the one week or two week mark. So after you've sent in your materials, just a, a quick email to whoever's leading the the search committee um, to ask them, you know, can you tell me um, how the process is going or give me any feedback so far um, as of me as a candidate? It, it, it can be tough though, because 
sometimes you, you can go for quite some time without hearing anything. And I know that can be discouraging, but you just have to, you know, believe in your work and believe that the school you're applying to is one that you really have a, you're a great match for. And you have to hope that their process is one that really is inclusive and keeps you aware and up to date on, on the search. I believe there's a question here about how common are endowments for K-8 schools and how would one cultivate giving toward an endowment for a K-8? So the vast majority of independent schools and boarding schools that I've worked for all had endowments and I've worked in K-8, K-9, K-12 schools. Now, the amount they have in their endowment can vary. But most of them, as I told you before, that is a defining characteristic of an independent school. So your first question, <coughs> in terms of how common it is, I would say very common. The second part of the question about cultivating giving toward an endowment, that's uh, really in the domain of the advancement and development and kind of an alumni office, they're the ones that often will come up with campaigns, uh, events that bring alumni back on campus or current families. Sometimes, um, you know, there are other campaigns going on simultaneously, meaning there could be capital campaigns where you're trying to build a new building and uh, you know, you're reaching out to donors for that. So that's a whole other webinar that, that gets really, really, could get really in depth. But um, that first part of your question, I, I'm confident to say that that's, if not all, most have endowments. And those that don't, I would say, strive towards creating one and growing one. So we're, we are... I think uh, with about 10 minutes left, are there any other questions that I'm able to answer in the moment? What I've done on this page here, as you, as you may think of some other questions, obviously I, I have my full name. Oh, sorry. I have my, oh, uh, okay. Have my full name there. Uh, my preferred email, my website, and then uh, I'm, I'm on Twitter a lot as one of those four social media platforms that, I'm, that I use. I'm also on LinkedIn. So any of you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. There's a part, if you do use LinkedIn, uh, that allows you to make a connection request, but it also allows you to put a little message in. And I would really appreciate it if you referred to this webinar so I have a point of uh, connection and, and it will help me remember that um, you you met me through that that uh, medium. Okay. Well, there's no more questions. We would like to say thank you, Dean. We appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise with the TC community. And also, a video of this presentation will be available on our website. Um, you can see it at www.tc.edu slash alumni slash career webinars. And please visit our website for more information about our monthly webinars. The next webinar will be held on Tuesday, April 24th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time uh, with Carmela Bennett. And uh, the subject would be embodied leadership, building the capacity for mindfulness in action. Thank you again, Dean, and thank you all for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night.